Okay, Chair, you can now call your meeting. Okay, to thank you, Dominique. Um, I'd like to call the regular meeting of the Seaside Planning Commission for Wednesday, January 10th, 2024 to order. Can we um, uh, start with a uh, roll call, please? Commissioner Wynn? Commissioner Evans? Present. Commissioner LaMica? Present. Commissioner Owens? Commissioner Dodson? Present. And Chair Silva? Present. You do have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, item three is the review of the agenda. Um, the Are there any items on the agenda that, um, that or any items that have arisen after the 72 hour posting deadline that we need to address? Are we aware of anything? Staff, no? Okay, move on to item number four. Uh, public comment, this is a general public comment period. This is not for public comment on items that are on the agenda. But if anybody um, wishes to uh, make a comment uh, that relates to the city of Seaside in general, but not on tonight's agenda, you can come forward and state your name and um, we'll give you three minutes to, uh, to do so. All right, seeing nobody approaching um, the podium, we're gonna move on to item number five, approval of the minutes. Do um, we have any comments or uh, questions? Yeah, I had a I had a question about them. I I hope I was looking at the right ones, but when I was looking at the package for the meeting, it didn't appear that there was any detail at all. Uh, maybe I was looking at an early draft or something. It just said that, that basically what the vote was, and if anybody from the public talked. If we aren't sure about it, do we want to table this item to the next meeting and we can address it, make sure we get everybody to well, review that? And I think it would be good uh, if, if that's correct, because uh, we do, there were some things that we added to some of the items before we, we approve them. Can I get a motion to table the, that or, or continue that item to the next meeting? And we'll yeah, I, I move to table the approval of the minutes for this meeting and to uh, move them to the next meeting. Just to clarify, that's the, the minutes from the December 13th, 2023 meeting. I'll, I'll second. Okay. I'll second, but I would like to clarify with Dominique. Yes. Um, if she's online. So, the, or if she's on the, the stream. So, Dominique, sometimes minutes are purposely uh, minimalistic. <clears throat> I just want to make sure that that, either that these were placeholder things, because I, I noticed the same thing that Keith did, or was that intentional? Was was what there, what you and you or whoever did the minutes intended? Yes, the minutes were intended to be action minutes that just captured the action. But if there's more details that the commission would like to see included in those minutes, then I'd be happy to incorporate those and resubmit for approval at the next meeting. Yeah, the, the thing I feel is most important is if we made any uh, revisions to the initial suggestion for approval it should be in the minutes all right so i'll just add I'll, I'll add one thing to that yeah. dominic for example just a specific thing i thought that we when we tabled uh the item that is appearing tonight that we had we actually had a motion and we seconded it and we approved it based on certain terminology and it just simply said on the minutes that the, the planning commission asked that it be tabled. I just thought that was incorrect, but I, I could be wrong. I haven't gone back and watched the video. So things like that, that I'd like to have clarified. Okay, so we have a motion to um, continue the minutes from the approval of the minutes from December 13th, 2023 to our next meeting with some um, comments to staff on just what clarification the commissioners would like to see. And that's been seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So that's been approved. Um, items of business number six. The first item of business was the presentation uh, on street selection for pavement rehabilitation projects. Um, we are expecting Commissioner Owens tonight, but he is not currently here. This was um, an item of particular interest to Commissioner Owens. So um, what I've, I'd like to do, I've spoken to staff about it, is I'd like to table this item, move on to item B um, to give Mr. Owens a chance to arrive if he's coming late and then 
we can address it as the second item on the agenda. Is everybody okay with that? Do we need a motion for that? Or we're just tabling, we'll come back to it. Okay, perfect. So let's move on to item B, which is architectural review application number AR23-15, Ecological Architects and Thomas Rettenwender applicant and Adan Munoz, property owner, request architectural review approval of a second story balcony and a roof deck attached to an accessory dwelling unit um, located at 1204 San Lucas Street. Um, Eric, are you going to be giving us a presentation? Yes. All right, it's yours. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, Dominique, it still says this meeting is being recorded on top of that. Yes, it is being recorded. There, Dominique, there's a window open that's um, on the screen saying that it's re being recorded and you need to hit got it in order to um, to clear that so that we can actually see the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, Eric, will you hit got it on the computer in the chamber? <clears throat> All right, there we go. Thank you. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Eric Asriel, Assistant Planner, and I will be presenting this project. This project is for a second story balcony that is attached to an ADU and a connected roof deck built above the garage. The ADU itself is not under review. The balcony and the roof deck require architectural review because they are second story elements. This is located at 1204 San Lucas Street. And uh, I will point out that north for this map is to the left. This is to be oriented similar to the floor plans and such later that we will see. Uh, it is a fairly small parcel. It is a key lot, so it is not a corner lot, but the side of the lot is against an alley, uh, which uh, we'll see more of and it makes some things interesting. Uh, there is a planned 12, uh, just under 12 square, 1200 square foot ADU. Um, again, that's not under review and an existing 880 square foot dwelling. So this is a close up of the parcel. And I want in particular to draw your attention to this garage. This is an existing garage that is going to be partially converted into an ADU. And part of it will have the roof deck on top, and then the remainder of it will be turned into a green roof. So much like we see here, we have the green roof right here, the, the roof deck, and then the balcony. Next slide, please. It is a fairly long balcony, four feet wide, 12 and a half feet tall at the guard. Next slide. And the roof deck is also uh, 12 and a half feet tall. Uh, the parapet will be planted with succulents. Uh, we are highlighting here that there is a condition of approval regarding the parapet where there has been an ongoing discussion between the applicant and the building department about how tall that parapet has to be. So the condition of approval states that the parapet will be the height that the building department requires. Here, I want to highlight the existing garage. This is from a survey that was done by the applicant. It is very close to the property lines. So we have 1.4 feet here setback and one and a 1.5 feet here. This means that because of the accessory structure nature of the roof deck and the balcony, they have to be five feet away from the property line, which brings us into the actual design. Next slide. Can I interrupt for just one second? Uh, as you drive down that alley, the uh, what you're suggesting then is that the the building of the fence, not the lot line, is actually about a foot and a half into the alley. That is my understanding. Because of the location 
in relation to the property line, the roof deck is five feet back and also five foot back from the primary dwelling to satisfy the requirements of our accessory structure code. As a note, because we're talking about setbacks on the right hand side, we see that the balcony is just a bit over seven feet from the property line. Next slide. Highlighting nearby two-story dwellings, there are a few, and there are a few more dwellings outside of this. Uh, I will also note uh, that on the bottom right-hand corner, well, we can see a church. It is a rather large church, fairly tall. Next slide. Uh, so again, we're sticking with specifically the balcony and the roof deck and the materials for those. Uh, I will also talk about the uh, materials for uh, I will also talk about the materials for the ADU and the house just to provide context. So the materials for the balcony specifically, uh, as well as the roof deck, it's going to use Trex decking, um, black metal guard rail. If you did go out and visit the site, you will, would have noticed that it's currently more of a brown theme. Um, the theme is being changed to white, black, and gray. The green roof is going to be mixed succulents and hand watered. Next slide. So again, for context, uh, the ADU in the house are being changed to white stucco siding, grass asphalt shingles, white vinyl windows, and wood columns stained black. We will see some wood columns in the elevations. Sorry to interrupt again. So is that a change from our packet? I don't remember that packet. Um, that is a change. Uh, the, there was a communication from the applicant. Next slide. So this is the existing appearance. Next slide. And here are two elevations. Again, here we are specifically focusing on the roof deck, which is here, and the balcony, which you will see in the next ones. Next slide. So this is the view from the nearest neighbor. Uh, we can see here, this is the railing from the balcony, and this is the railing for the roof deck. Next slide. The appearance from internal to the property, looking back at the ADU and the balcony and the roof deck. Next slide. And finally, this is the uh, view of the ADU from the back. So the only part that we are talking about on this slide is all the way on the right-hand side, that roof deck portion. Everything else is the ADU. Next slide. Staff does recommend that the commission approve the architectural view subject to attachment one. Hey, commissioners, any questions of staff before we open up to public comment? Commissioner Mike, Mike Rubino. My only question would be, since, you know, again, when you go out there and you look at it, it just looks like the bottom line is the fence and the, the building. So the garage is either going to have to be that one wall torn down and moved three and a half feet in. Is that what I'm understanding? Well, it's just allowed to remain as long as it is not reconstructed. It is a non-conforming non structure. It's going to stay that way. So it's going to, that's, mm -hmm. the way that alley is going to look is, doesn't look great right now. So that's how it's going to look. So how is, how is that, what we're looking at, how is that going to stay within the setback? The roof deck itself is five feet back. So in other words, he's offsetting it from that garage. Mm -hmm. back. Got it. And then the parapet, which is for safety, is the part that will be uh, closer. But the roof deck itself will not be in the setback at all. So, and I, I realize that we're not approving the ADU, but raise a question. My understanding of ADU uh, statutes 
are that if a garage is converted to an ADU, it could be actually on the property line. There's no step back requirements whatsoever. So I'm just puzzled why we, we are even bringing up that it can't be on the property line when the state allows it to be on the property line. Uh, certainly. Uh, this, AD, this garage is having two projects done to it. One is part of it is being converted to an ADU. Uh, we are not talking about that. Uh, we're not concerned about the setbacks for that because, as you said, uh, whatever exists can be converted. The second part is that there is the balcony that is attached to the ADU and that is treated separately from the ADU and okay. that the roof deck is also treated separately from the ADU. Perfect. All right. So this time, if the applicant or applicant's architect um, uh, are here and would like to speak to the commission, we'll give you up to five minutes to the podium. You're welcome to come forward and introduce yourself and uh, state your name and um, say whatever you like. So uh, thank you. Yeah, good evening. My name is Thomas Rettenvender, the architect, uh, Dan Munoz, the uh, the owner. And um, yeah, no, thanks for the the um, the the tour of the project and the description of the project and thanks for recommending its approval. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's, it has been a long, uh, a long uh, road to get here. Uh, I think the project was, um, was uh, submitted uh, about 18 months ago. And then we got our first comments back in about May or June of 2022. So uh, I, I think because of the, um, changes in staff at the planning department. The project got kind of uh, bounced back and forth uh, multiple times. So it's been, it's been in, uh, yeah, it's been in planning review about, it seems like it's been about 18 months or so. Um, so yeah, just to kind of, you know, point that out, um, it's been a, been a long road. But, um, but yeah, the, uh, you know, I think just beyond that, it's uh, just trying to take advantage of the and the nice view uh, there on the property. Uh, the, the roof deck and the balcony will really um, add, add um, aesthetic um, uh, value to the, to the project. And so, um, yeah, we hope, uh, we hope to, um, to get it approved and, and, and move forward. Um, yeah, so I'll just let, let Adan, the owner, talk as well. Good evening. I uh, just wanted to uh, point out here, the unit... Do me a favor and state your name for the microphone. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Dan Munoz. Thank you. Yes. So uh, as the uh, resident of Seaside, living in that property for like almost 30 years, my goal is just to make sure that my project, my uh, house in general will look uh, good and will be uh, useful as a living space, that that's what I want since... Uh, the house is kind of small, and um, and I would like to really try to see if we can, since the project is waiting quite a while, and um, uh, see if we can try to move on with the project. And again, it's it's been a long road, and I'm hoping that uh, this uh, project will get done as soon as uh, possible. If that's you know something that uh, uh, Eric can. And anybody else here in the city will consider. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mendo. Well, um, Commissioner, do we have any questions of the applicant before we open to the general public? No. No. Okay. So this time we're going to open up public comment to anybody in the public wishing to speak on this matter. You'll have up to three minutes um, to do so, and you come forward and, and state your name, or if you are online, um, or no, we're not doing online comments anymore, are we? Never mind. Um, is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak on this matter? All right, seeing that we're gonna close the public comment period and bring it back to the commission. Just a couple of couple of things that I'm interested in, um, mostly for Dominique, if she's listening. Um, since we don't have our, our computers up here, uh, I'm having to pull up the packet on my phone and it's kind of cumbersome and difficult. So, it sure would be easier if we don't have the computers to have the packet printed so that we can at least have it here. Otherwise we're gonna have to print it at home and bring it ourselves. Um, and I just had a question for Eric. Um, under the uh, considerations, so this is on page 11, so you may not even have it there, but on page 11, 
we got the considerations and we have the architectural. And it, I have just never seen this verbiage before. I'm sure it's been there and I just haven't noticed it. So I want some clarification just for my education. So we got considerations and it says architecture review requires the following considerations for single family projects, but no findings. And so then it quotes our, our job as the Board of Architecture Review, which we on this commission are getting our feet wet on all that because we've been the planning commission for years and years and years, and now we've absorbed the BAR responsibility. So why is it that something as important as 1762030E1 doesn't require any findings? It's just more a question for me to, to get the answer to. Um. Only I do have an answer. I believe Andrew, uh, Andrew will be uh, best qualified to answer this. Uh, the uh, the Board of Architectural Review did not have the same uh, land authority, land use authority that the Planning Commission did. But uh, I will. Thank you. And um, it's actually a, a fairly simple answer: is that all the findings are defined by the code. And under architectural review, there's no findings listed. Right. So that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. Thank you. All right, commissioners, any other comments or questions? Can we entertain a motion? Well, Danny's not here, so I guess I better go. <laughs> I move that we approve architecture review application number AR23 15 um, for the project located at 1204 San Lucas Street. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. We have a unanimous approval. Um, there is an appeal statement. An appeal may be submitted in writing within seven calendar days from the date of this meeting. The appeal shall state the pertinent facts and the basis for the appeal and shall be accompanied by the required filing fee. Appeals to the city uh, uh, should be made to the city council um, through the city clerk. Uh, so congratulations on your approval. Sorry, it's taken as long as it has. Um, with that said, we're going to, um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like Commissioner Owens is going to join us, but um, we're going to move to item A, which is the presentation on the street selection for pavement rehabilitation projects. That's what happens when you follow Andrew. Yeah. Pull the microphone down. It's true. Good evening, Planning Commission. I'm Nisha Patel, Public Works Director and City Engineer. And I am here with Joe Ryrie, our Pavement Engineering Consultant. And we're here to present uh, how we select streets for our, our pavement projects. Um, Joe, I uh, is our um, pavement consultant who uh, updated our pavement management program. He uh, also uh, uh, developed our street rehabilitation policy, and he also developed our five-year uh, pavement program. Um, and he's currently um, uh, doing the design for our current pavement rehabilitation project. Uh, which will be executed later this fiscal year. So um, I'm going to let Joe proceed. Nisha, could I interrupt for just one second? Sure. Um, do you happen to remember the council meeting where a lot of this was presented? Yes, it was December. Do you have the date? It was, I think. That was February 16th. Oh, um, December was the pavement, I think the pavement program. Well, you gave a lot of background and backstory yeah. on how you selected things. And I, I meant to mention that at the last yes. meeting, but, you know, it would be good for those that are here and those that are listening. Oh, uh, it was in case February they don't get all their questions 16th. answered tonight. It was, was February, February 16th. Okay, so about a year ago. Yes. And it's, it's, that was a very good presentation, by the way. So thank you. Well, it's wonderful to be able to be here. I need to go up just a little bit for uh, uh, niche is just a little bit shorter than I am. Um, my name is Joe Ryrie, and I am um, a consultant with uh, Pavement Engineering. And our firm is a civil engineering firm, and we specialize in pavements, and we get a chance to work with 
agencies all throughout California. And we're happy to be here working um, and assisting Seaside with uh, their pavements right now. I want to, uh, um, I was glad to hear that you thought the presentation in February was, was um, worthwhile because we're gonna be reviewing some of that again tonight. Um, the goals that I have tonight is to get into how streets are selected, but we need, in order to be able to understand how that works, we're gonna really need to be able to um, dig into some background information. And so a lot of this presentation is from the February 16th presentation made to the council. And then um, after that, so we're gonna go through pavement 101, we're gonna go through pavement uh, management principles. Um, we're gonna go into the assessment findings so that we all are on the same page with the needs of Seaside, and then we'll get into the street selection. But with that background, I think it will um, really help everyone understand how we are selecting the streets with the limited dollars that Seaside has available. So if I, um, Dominique, is does this thing even work or are you running this thing? I'm running it. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, then I'm going to set it down because I thought I was doing something. Okay. So let's jump into pavement 101 altogether. Okay. Uh, next slide. Mm. So when we talk about pavement, pavement is a, is a structure uh, that is dependent on two different forces. One of the forces comes from what is on top of the pavement and that we refer to that as the loading conditions or whatever, whatever is driving on it. Um, and then we also need to look at what it's being built on. And, and depending on uh, the nature of the underlying soil and the amount of loading on top, that dictates how thick that pavement section needs to be in order to bridge the traffic over the whatever the soil condition is. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is a pavement deterioration curve and it's important to understand that a pavement, that, uh, when we talk about asphalt pavement, which is most of the pavements in, in Seaside, they do not deteriorate linearly. They deteriorate in more of an S-shaped fashion. And that S-shaped fashion means that the pavement will look good for um, quite a while and then it just drops off and it and it gets into a poor on roads. So we drive and we say, wow, when did this road get so bad? And it just kind of sneaks up on you because the pavement looks good and then it just falls off off and there's a reason why. In our next slide, we're going to um, talk about two different conditions. So next slide, Dominic. So um, when we, uh, when asphalt deteriorates, it deteriorates from two different ways. One is from the environmental effects of sun and water, oxidizing the binder, and the second is from loading conditions. And let's look at each one of these just a little bit more in detail. So if we go to the next slide, we'll be able to see that in the oxidizing effects of the sun and water, if we understand that the asphalt is made up of, of different size aggregates, that it's all held together by oil, or we call that oil a binder because it's holding it all together. Over time and over exposure to from the sun and from water, that binder begins to age harden and starts to oxidize. And as it oxidizes, it actually starts losing some of the volatiles of the oil volatiles that are in there. And, and it will actually shrink in volume. And as it shrinks, it the cracks begin to form. And then as the cracks begin to form, the water is able to get inside of it and accelerate that deterioration and that oxidizing and then when it breaks all the way through and goes all the way down to the bottom and gets into the subgrade it starts it starts compromising the integrity of the subgrade and so that's why pavement looks good for a while and then it drops off quickly in our next slide we'll see the impact of the uh, loading conditions and so to help everyone understand there's a lot of engineering that goes into the loading 
But in order to kind of make it more simplified, this is something that we came up with. And we've been doing this for a lot of years. And so we use a base vehicle, um, a Chevy S10 Blazer is what we have. So these are Chevy S10 Blazer units. And we compared, and a Chevy S10 Blazer, for those who don't remember, is like a small little SUV. It's a passenger vehicle is what it is. And so a typical uh, two axle truck is equal to 442 Chevy S10 Blazers. One fully loaded five axle truck that's delivering to our, our local grocery store um, or to the hardware store is equal to almost 15,000 Chevy S10 Blazer units. Um, if you go up the slide just a little bit, you'll see garbage trucks. Um, garbage trucks are almost 10,000, uh, basically the equivalent of 10,000 vehicles passing at one time. Um, that's significant because in in a few years ago, we were only seeing one garbage truck trip per week. Now we're seeing three. And so it's consuming the pavement life a lot faster on our residential streets, which really weren't designed to be able to handle that kind of loading. So on our next slide, we can see some uh, typical types of pavement distresses. Uh, these are the four most common. There's actually eight di different distresses that we, we account for, but the most common are the ones shown in this picture of the fines from the surface of the pavement. And that happens as traffic travels on it or as water um, sheds off of the pavement, it begins to lose those fines. And we refer to that as weathering and raveling. The next slide over is called uh, uh, transverse or or longitudinal cracking. When they, whoop, sorry, the next page picture over, sorry, Dominique. Um, the uh, next picture over shows uh, transverse or longitudinal cracking. When pavement is, is constructed, there's usually paving joints where they're overlapping uh, their passes because they can't pave a whole road usually in one pass. And so that's usually the first place is at that weak joint where there's a paving joint. And then as the pavement begins or keeps shrinking, you get the transverse joints. And in the next picture over uh, is block cracking and that's that usually starts happening as the pavement shrinks and it's about a 20 by 20 square is usually where you'll see that and then it breaks down into five by five or 10 by 10 then five by five and it just keeps getting smaller and smaller as it continues to crack those first three are all environmental distresses which means that you build an asphalt pavement and it never sees a, a car or a truck or anything in its lifetime it's still going to exhibit those kind of distresses. The fourth one is a um, is alligator cracking, and when we see alligator cracking, we know that that's fatigue related because the pavement is getting bent and bent and bent, and it fatigues, and it's actually cracking from the bottom up. So. If they think it looks bad on the top, if we could somehow flip it over like a pancake, we'd see that it actually looks worse on the bottom. So these are typical distresses. So when you're driving around looking at the streets of Seaside, you'll be able to say, oh, I, that's an environmental type of distress and, and that's a, a load related distress. So in our next slide, we, uh, next slide over, Dominique. I think I put her to sleep with the distresses. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, we look at, uh, we gather all of those distresses together and in engineering, we put them into what we call a pavement condition index or a PCI. It's our way of being able to communicate easily with between agencies or between decision makers. What are, what's the overall condition of, of a pavement? And so we break it down into um, a, a spread from a hundred down to zero, hundred being perfect, brand new pavement down to zero, which is, uh, there are so many distresses that it just looks like a bomb went off. And so um, our, we have a couple of pictures of typical types of pavement. So in our next slide,
Um, these are the list of all of the different types of distresses that go into the PCI, but um, I wanted to show some pictures. So our next slide over. Okay, so this is a roadway that is brand new, just paved, and so it's 100. This PCI is 100. You're not going to see any of those types of distresses on there. Our next slide uh, is a pavement that's at 85. There's really no cracking, but there's a lot of weathering and raveling happening on this pavement, and that's usually the first thing that starts happening. Um, and that's still considered in good condition. Notice this one is, has a PCI of 70, and you're starting to see that longitudinal crack down the middle and some little bit of transverse cracking beginning to form. In our next slide, you're going to start seeing that that cracking is starting to manifest into some alligator cracking at the joints. And then the next slide, you'll see some more alligator cracking begin to form in the those weak areas and along the wheel paths. In our next slide, um, we see uh, this is a, a PCI of 38, and you can see that there's weathering, raveling, alligator cracking, transverse, and it's all of it starting to show up and manifest. Um, this is obviously a pavement in poor condition. And in the next slide, um, this I always thought this was a really interesting one because there's a truck route on this road, and you, can you guess which side the truck route is on? Um, sometimes pavements will start talking to you if you understand what you're looking for. And so in this case, you can really see that there's some problems and why those problems might be occurring. And then in our, our next slide, um, just reminds us why we have roads in the first place. Okay. So that's a little bit about pavement 101 and gives some ba basic understanding of how pavements deteriorate and what goes into, um, um, some of the design. So let's talk about how do we manage pavements. And so and there's a principle that we try and adhere to, and that is quite simply applying the right treatment to the right pavement at the right time using the right material. Now, I'm a, I'm a picture guy, and so if we go to the next slide, um, we graphically see that. So remember our deterioration curve? And we know that as the pavement begins to deteriorate, we apply different treatments along that curve. And so at the top of the curve, you can see there's crack sealing, further down slurry sealing, different types of treatment, all the way down to reconstruction at the very bottom. Just to illustrate the importance of doing the right treatment at the right time, you would never take a pavement that was in really good condition and reconstruct it, you would be wasting your money. Conversely, you don't take a pavement that's in bad condition and just put crack seal on it. Again, you're wasting your money. So the principle is doing the right treatment at the right time to the right pavement. And so um, in our next slide, when we manage pavements, and this is when we have limited dollars, if we had a full bank account, we could just go treat whatever street needed it whenever we needed it and we would be fine. The problem is, is Seaside doesn't have the available money, and quite frankly, no agency in California really has enough money to handle all of their roads. And so we apply different types of pavement management strategies. And over the times that I've been doing this, uh, there's only three different management uh, or strategies that, that can be applied. The first one is uh, referred to as best first management or top down. Um, that is a focus of your money spent on trying to keep your good pavements good. Um, and then the next strategy is a worse first type of a strategy, which is always taking whatever limited funding you have and, and using it on the worst streets in town. Um, those two are not sustainable over a long period of time. If you're always spending your money on your good streets, then you're going to think of the deterioration curve. You're going to have a group of good streets and a group of bad streets because of, of the deterioration. Um, if you're always spending all of your money on the worst streets in town, then literally you are spending a great deal of money 
on those reconstruction, which is the most expensive type of treatments. And therefore, you're not treating as much of your system. You're, it limits the amount of work you can do because those are very, very expensive treatments. And so the principle that we try and work with and apply when managing um, agencies is a critical point management style. So again, let's go to the next slide and show what that means graphically. So critical point management is literally picking the streets at, in that need that treatment right before it falls into needing the next treatment below that. And so at each one of these points, remember all those places that we were pointing along the curve for different kinds of treatments, we're trying to group those into that area where you see the red circles, trying to capture those, those pavements right before they drop into needing the next category. Why would we do that? In the next slide, we'll see that um, there's cost uh, measures associated with that. When you're doing uh, treatments in the upper end of the deterioration curve, you're dealing with, with just a few cents or maybe up to a dollar per square foot. As those treatments, as you start moving down on the deterioration curve, those treatments begin to get more and more and more expensive. And you can see that down at the bottom, reconstruction can be anywhere from $24 up to $31 a square foot in order to, to treat it. But if you can treat a pavement that only needs light maintenance, then you're treating it for about a dollar a square foot. And so the idea and the principle is, is that you want to pick treatments in all of these different categories is part of your pavement management plan and addressing those pavements that need those those uh, treatments at the time. Okay, you still with me? All right, next slide. Let's uh, talk about the funding needs that we found out uh, that the city of Seaside has, and this is what was presented to the council a year ago, um, there's five different scenarios that we ran. Uh, the system right now is at a 59. That's its average PCI. And so the the average PCI, um, in order to maintain that, is, is going to cost about $6.8 million a year just to maintain the system. Um, if you wanted to improve the system, uh, by five points over five years, so one point per year, it would require an investment of $10 million per year in order to, to move the needle upwards. The system actually has a backlog of, a, of uh, several million dollars. Um, and if we could spend all the money, and we're looking at the green line, all that money, it actually puts it up into the 80 range, and then it will only cost about $3 million to maintain it. But getting to that level would, would if I remember the number exactly, it's about $75 million to get it upwards in that number. <laughs> so um, if you spent no money, uh, we told the council that, uh, you would end up with a PCI of 46 at the end of five years is our projection. And um, at their current funding level, which is uh, $2 million this fiscal year and about a million dollars each following fiscal year, um, there's, they're projected to end up at a 49. The system is. Okay, that's the funding needs. So let's talk about the assessment. Uh, findings. And so, so there's 79 center line miles of road. million square feet of pave um, 59 and the replacement value is $360 million. That's just the pavement. So it's a rather large asset uh, that the city is managing and maintaining. Next slide. The this is a, a PCI map by color. Green is on the upper end of the scale. Um, yellow, orange, and red are down in the lower end of the scale, 50 and below. So you can see how things uh, played out uh, or are playing out throughout the, the system. 
Next slide. Um, the arterials, it's a 59 PCI, but your arterial system is actually in pretty good shape. There's, there was a bond, a $10 million bond that went out, and a lot of that focus was on the arterial system throughout the city, um, and it improved the overall PCI up to a 75, which is a very enviable place to be for your, um, for any road system. Um, the arterials are usually focused on first because of uh, more people use them. They have more impact uh, for everybody. And so, again, it's a strategy to use when you have limited dollars. Um, going on to the, wait a second, hold on one second, please. When, hey, thank you. Um, collectors are at a 61, residentials are at a 52. You can see the progression, again, the, the, um, more localized streets the in worse condition they are. And then, of course, the alleys are in really poor shape um, here in the city. They're at a 27. Okay, our next slide, please. This is how the system breaks down. Um, I call this um, a 10-point spread because we're grouping together all of the PCIs in 10-point groups. So the first bar graph on the left is uh, uh, the percentage of the system that has PCIs between 100 and 91. And then there's the, the next one over is 90 to 81. And so um, I'm able to take a look at this and start developing a strategy. And what the strategy is that needs to happen is you see those two spikes that are kind of uh, manifest in the um, 10 point spread. There's a group in Good Street in, of Good Streets up at the upper end. And then there's kind of this group that's, that's um, in the 40 to the, I'm sorry, the 50 to 30 range right in there. There's another large group. Notice that there's very few streets down uh, below 20 uh, throughout the city. Uh, so there's been a lot of effort to try and, and uh, clean up those streets in really bad, bad condition throughout the city. But the strategy is, is trying to focus on those streets, trying to keep so those, those streets are in good condition, and then also focusing on those streets that are down in the lower condition. And I'm also going to point out, you see the green part of the graph? Those are the residential streets, and that's significant because the pavement policy that was approved last February is more of a focus on the residential streets because of the bond measure helping all of the arterial streets to get in much better condition. So now we need to focus on those residential streets. And, um, and but we still need to keep those those good streets, the arterials, the streets, the investment that we've made in those streets still in good condition when it's only going to cost us a little bit of money. So the strategy, um, okay, next slide, please. Oh, this shows all of the um, arterial streets that were done as with that $10 million bond. Uh, quite a, a a really good range. The colors are not PCI conditions. The colors are years that the the uh, street was treated. Okay, our next slide. So now let's, with all of that background, now we can get into some of the details of how it was that, or how we come up with these, um, the street recommendations. So we start with using the Street Saver database. And this is, it's not intended for you to absorb all of the information on the slide. It just is supposed to, there's, there's a lot of information that we're evaluating and reviewing as we try and pull this information together. Um, the next slide. Um, is is the the prioritization that we use for potential candidate streets. So we take that information, all of the street information from the Street Saver database, and then we start filtering it out. And the first thing that we we do is is we look at the pavement uh, policy that was approved by council, and. Uh, and 
and use that as our first filter. Then the next thing that we want to be able to do um, is we want to be able to account for any future work that is going on, um, programmed CIP projects, uh, development projects, other things that are going to be affecting those streets, and make sure that we we don't go and do a street that is going to someone else is going to be working on. That's again a waste of the money. Um, we want to be able to coordinate with all the utility companies. Nothing is more embarrassing than having a brand new street and having a utility company come back later and cut it up. Um, that's you try not to have that happen. Um, and then, of course, uh, part of the selection is working with the available budget that we have. So let's review the street rehabilitation uh, policy, which is in our next slide. This is what was presented to the council. And so what we're doing is, is we're taking whatever is available funding there is, and we're breaking it into uh, two different categories. And one is, is we're taking 80% of it, and we're focusing on the uh, residential streets. And that's the, um, uh, let's see, the one, two, three, fourth column over. It's basically right in the center of the page. And then to the right is we're taking 20% and we're dividing up the um, funding uh, using to keep your arterial system in good condition. And then your residential uh, system, we're looking at streets for reconstruction. Again, we're trying to pull from all of the areas of the deterioration curve with using critical point uh, selection on those on the streets. Um, this shows what is the projected available funding and how much money is being used in each of those different um, categories. So we took the funding, we spread it out, and then we started looking at all of the streets and and sorted it and filtered it and worked our way down using you know, coordinating with the utilities and coordinating with CIP projects and coordinating with other things to whittle it down into the streets and uh, that were being proposed. In our next slide, we'll show the 2023 project uh, streets that are um, being in, that are in design right now and will be built this summer. Um, this this list was approved by council in the same meeting, February 16th. And in our next slide, which I think is gonna be our last one, um, although I'm sure no one wants this to end because pavement is so exciting to talk about, right? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, um, this is this is this year's plan, and you're if you uh, really zoomed in on it, you would be able to see that there's different treatments uh, that we're using and and are selecting. But there's these are all the uh, we're really focusing this first year on on residential streets and and putting the money there to try and and assist those streets um, because the arterial streets are in such good condition. So then our last slide is just questions. Thank you very much. Actually, for what may otherwise be a, a, a dry topic, you, you made it very accessible and interesting. So I do appreciate that. Um, do we have questions from the commission? Really just more question for Nisha, I think. Um, the, you know, people ask me about the streets all the time. You know, they see us on the planning commission and so they go after us. <laughs> Should we direct them, especially on some of these streets, which just have the, the I'm forgotten now the phrase, you, the, the transfers cracking. So I assume that's a fairly inexpensive, take out some, some whatever it is, you put tar and oil or whatever, and you just put it in that crack. And I know some people that I've directed them to see click fix and said, hey, you know, let the city know. I'm sure they know, but let's let the city know and public works can get out there and do something. And a couple of those that I've got personal experience of where they pointed those out to me, nothing's been done in a year. So is that something that we should direct them to, or is it something that at this point is unrealistic? They should direct those uh, requests to see clip fix because Joe just went over the pavement rehabilitation um, program, but we also have a maintenance program. And so yearly, uh, our crew does do crack sealing and pothole repairs. And 
Do you want to yeah. say anything else about our paper? What what should people expect to be the time frame for something to be addressed, assuming that it can get get addressed? You know, um, Commissioner, that's a really good question. And the council has been very serious about what do we, they know that they have limited dollars. They know that they're only able to touch just a, a, a scratching at the surface of the real needs of the city. Um, and um, the council, I was very impressed with this. I haven't seen other councils do this, but they have agreed to take a portion of the the remaining funding that they have, excess funding, budget funding at the from their general fund at the end of each year and put it towards what we're calling a, a, a hotspot repair program. This last year, they spent $600,000 um, going out and, and additional on top of what they already allocated for the other paving funding. And um, we were able to address a lot of those streets on the C-click fix um, items. We did uh, some thin maintenance overlays. We did some localized dig outs. What's the great thing about this is, is those are stopgap measures that we're applying to those streets uh, and to hold them together until the right treatment, remember the right pavement, the right treatment to the right pavement can be done on those streets. So it's not money that's being wasted. So it's basically like we're doing the prep work in anticipation of coming back and being able to do the overlays and other things that need to happen that makes the, the streets look all completely finished. Um, an example of some of the, um, uh, like the thin maintenance overlay that we did on, um, on Roberts uh, behind, um, Home Depot. I invite you, anyone to go drive back there now, and we put we put a thin maintenance overlay to hold that street together. It needs a, a regular overlay from edge to edge, but at least it's going to um, hold it together for right now. And the council has agreed that every year they're going to look at those funding. So and how much available funding they're having. And so they're kind of thinking it's going to be about a half a million dollars. And so. Um, we are, we're assisting the city by going through that C click fix list and, um, we're always monitoring it. In addition, we're going out and looking at the streets too, to identify our own areas that need, um, attention. Again, we're trying to hold things together, um, and, and approach it with these stopgap measures. And so we've got an ongoing list that we have and, Whenever the money becomes available, we're working down the list. The list is like two and a half million dollars. And so at five hundred thousand dollars a year availability, you can see how long that it's going to take to get through that list. But please, please, please encourage everyone to go to the C click fix um, website, put in the streets that that information is getting looked at by by staff and by us as we're we're putting this together. Um, and then just, it's gonna be a matter of how much excess funding is available to go out and do that, those treatments. So that was a long answer to your question, but hopefully it helped you. In the event that degradation maybe doesn't um, occur as you might expect, mm -hmm. how often do you reevaluate the priorities or change those priorities, it, you know, from the standpoint of which streets are chosen? Um, you, you know what I mean? Because because even though you have a curve and you have an anticipation and this is the PCI and this is where we think it's going to be, I imagine that sometimes a street holds together better longer than you expected, whereas another one accelerates its deterioration faster. Absolutely. Okay. So if you've got this sort of five-year plan and you think, okay, we're going to strategically hit these streets, mm -hmm. how often do you revisit that so that you're as up to date with the plan as possible. Great question. Um, that actually is is dictated by by Tam C, who oversees the 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 city reports to Tam C on on what they're doing with their their paving dollars that they receive through Tam C, and Tam C requires that that we're looking at and updating the major streets, arterials and collectors, and evaluating them every three years. And then 
adding to that list on that on a six year cycle, all the residential. So every three years, your arterials and collectors are looked at. And every six years, your residential streets are are evaluated. And PCIs, you know, they'll deteriorate one to three points a year, typically kind of following, depending on where you are in that curve. So um, that's a very reasonable time to be working with. It's realistic. When you talk about a, a, a minor maintenance overlay, we're talking like a fog seal? Oh, no. Uh, the the treatments that we put up on uh, Roberts and I can drive to the street, but the name is escaping me. Uh, Mazes? Mazes? Yes, um, yeah. Up off of... Um, yeah. yeah, up at the top end of... Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, those, that was um, uh, a one-inch leveling course put in there we put it in a little bit thicker to fill the the potholes that were that were there um and so we're it's not just a fog seal um so we're we're really doing kind of two approaches there's this we're looking at those areas that that have potholes and localized failures and we're doing dig outs in those areas to replace those um, those poor sections. And then we're, um, if there's so many dig outs on the road, that's where we're putting that leveling course over the top to provide a smoother wearing surface. Commissioner Owens couldn't be here uh, for some reason tonight. And I know he would have wanted to have been. And I don't remember if, if you guys remember, but there was one particular anecdote that he gave us where he his concern was that there was a street that had been repaved just a couple of years ago, and it was repaved again when it didn't show any signs of needing to be repaved, yet intersecting streets that were adjacent to it were alligatoring and crumbling and falling apart. And I know his question was, how, how does that happen when we have such, you know, uh, a well thought out plan? Uh, I'd have to know which streets he was talking about to really be able to address that and what the treatment was, because. What was it? Yeah, he may, maybe we can encourage him to follow up with you with that question when he's able to. Okay. Because the other thing is the treatment too, because if the, you do a, a major rehabilitation, usually in a few years, you follow up with that that slurry seal over the top of it. The slurry seal protects against the environmental effects. A lot of people think, oh, you're retreating that street. Well, I'm just sealing the street and protecting it. It's like sunscreen, you know, when you're at the beach. So anyway, something along those lines. So to depend on which street, which treatment, and then we could, we'd be happy to address them. I have a question. Um, this came up last year when we had such a rainy, rainy year. And I was wondering, well, do they actually spend less money in a rainy year like that? And if so, can they bring it over to the next year? Because it seems like there were so many days when you probably couldn't do anything on the roads. Um, and so you lose all that time. Or is it the, a, a case where because it's so rainy, there's going to be more quick fixes you need to do? And so you don't actually save any time in a rainy or save any money in a rainy season? That's another good question and a good observation. When you're when it does rain, the roads will to the pavement deteriorates faster. And and so you start seeing more problems. And last year we saw a lot of problems that we hadn't seen in a while because we'd had so many dry years that and so um last year we saw a lot that was happening. Um what you try and do with a paving project, and again, part of pavement management is trying to get your projects out in a in certain times. Like you want to bid the projects during the winter time because that's when the contractors are looking for work for the summertime for building season, and um, they tend to be um, more competitive. And so you get better prices if you put your project out in. October or, uh, you know, the contractors are so busy, they can't see straight. And, and they're trying to get all their work done before winter hits. And so timing is really important, but there is an optimal window for being able to do pavement work. 
And that's usually between when the rainy season stops toward the end of March, all the way through um, October is where you're really trying to have that construction happen. Does that answer your question? Okay. See, this is such a fascinating subject. We could talk about it all night. All right, do we have any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Okay. At this point, we're gonna conclude that presentation. Um, that's not an issue that requires any couple comments. So we're gonna move on to item number C, architectural review application AR23-13, Thomas Rettenwender applicant and V Duong property owner request um, an architectural re review approval for a first and second story addition, including a new two car attached garage. Project is located at 8210, I'm sorry, at 1930 Luxton Street. And um, I apologize, Mr. Uh, Rettenwender, if I didn't realize that you were on two items. We might have done both of them before the presentation, but thank you for your patience. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Eric Azriel, Assistant Planner, uh, presenting this architectural review. Uh, this project is a two-story addition. It also uh, adds balconies to the front and the rear. It does require staking and flagging. Next slide. The staking and the flagging was up more than 14 days before the uh, hearing, and we will talk a little bit more about the staking and flagging later. Next slide. Uh, we are located here at, at 1930 Luxton Street. And uh, you can see it's mostly a single family residential neighborhood. There is a school just to the east and Boys and Girls Club is down here. And there is a church as well to the northeast. Next slide. So we are in the single family residential zone. Uh, this is a larger parcel, a bit over 8,000 square feet. And next slide. The addition itself is a bit over 1,300 square feet. Uh, it does demolish an existing single family, uh, existing one car garage and build a two car garage in its place. And uh, the rest of it, it, we'll just be talking about the addition and the two balconies. Next slide. Uh, this is a partial site plan. Uh, the on the uh, for this slide, we are north is up, and on the east of this, it is all empty land. Uh, I will zoom out as well later, but this is to give us a little bit more of a view of what is actually going on. We can see the house uh, centered, and there's an existing garage and an existing storage facility storage structure that will be demolished. Next slide. The proposed plan, uh, it expands a little bit on the existing footprint, mostly towards the rear with the addition and that garage. Uh, the two balconies are pointed out here as well. Next slide. Uh, just for comparison, here is the existing floor plan. I will note one thing if you're looking at all of the different uh, square footage calculations, uh, you may have noticed that there was the utility room was mentioned because it currently does not connect internally. So it's not counted as floor area, but it will be connected internally. So it will count as floor area. Next slide. So the proposed plan adds a living room, adds a garage, uh, connects the utility room. And I also will highlight that uh, we had an issue on the exhibit uh, where uh, this landing here uh, in a previous version of the plans was removed in order to allow for parking. So if we can hit the one more forward, please. This was the solution that was presented by the applicant and in the final version of the plans that got left out. So we are going requesting a condition of approval to allow the zoning administrator to make to approve corrections, which will be the next slide. That the zoning administrator may approve internal changes to the plan as needed to adjust for parking requirements. This is because our parking space has to have a minimum width and the landing in the garage made it too small. So it effectively made that big long garage into a one-car garage. 
Next slide. Uh, second floor plan. I'll just highlight the two balconies here, there and there. Three bedroom, one bath. All the standards are met. Uh, we have the uh, next slide, please. All the standards are met. We have the floor area ratio well below 0.45, well below on coverage uh, and height. I'll actually cover in a minute, but as it is currently proposed, and as you saw in the packet, it is at 23 feet, four inches. And two parking spaces are required uh, because it is over 1,201 square feet and two parking, two parking spaces are provided. Next slide. We have two balconies, um, balcony F in the front and balcony B in the back. The balcony F, uh, there we go. Uh, the balcony F is five feet from the closest property line. So it does go fairly close, uh, but it is not within the setback. Uh, it is still well within what is allowed. Balcony B is very far from any set from any property line. Next slide. So this is the full site plan. Uh, we can see all of the work is happening here. And just to show you, this is the balcony in the back and how far away it is from all of the property lines. The balcony in the front right here is the one that approaches the side property line to within five feet. Next slide. And highlighting the, those balconies again. Next slide. Uh, to give a little bit of background context for where those balconies are, the one in the front it neighbors this residence, the one in the back, it, it's a school. And up here is a church. Next slide. For the colors and materials, they are going to be made to match the existing colors and materials using the same type of siding, board and batten with a light gray as a primary and a dark gray as a trim. Next slide. For the balconies, there it's a little bit of an addition of color. They will use Trex decking, gray metal deck guard, and dark gray columns that we'll see a little bit more of with the elevations, which are coming up soon. Next slide. And uh, there are two spots with new lighting. Uh, one at the new exterior rear landing and one on the balcony in the rear. Next slide. So here's the west elevation. So this is the elevation that would be seen from Luxton Street from the front of the house. I do want to note the pitch of the roof here and the pitch of the roof here. Uh, there was a small issue with the staking and flagging where uh, when we went out to check it, it was not at the same pitch that was proposed on the drawings. Uh, speaking with the applicant, they ended up adjusting the drawings to match more closely with what was done with staking and flagging. So uh, we are proposing a condition of approval that allows the applicant to instead raise it up back to the full 24 feet, which was the original proposal, not 23 feet, four inches, in order to match the pitch of the existing roof. Next slide. And just, you can see a visual, it's a little hard to see here, but this pitch is flatter than this one. So the condition of approval is to allow those to match. Next slide. For the north elevation, uh, this is the side of the property. We are seeing some good variation. You can see the balcony there, the rear landing there. Next slide. The rear of the house, we can see the columns. Those will be painted dark gray. Next slide. And the south elevation. So this will face 
the side of the house directly to the south of it, which is actually of a fairly similar height we'll see in some photographs. Next slide. There are a couple of nearby two-story homes. We have directly to the south. We have one across La Salle Avenue. There's another one or two to the north. Um, not that common, but they do exist. Next slide. Next slide, please. So onto the photographs, and here we can see that uh, neighboring property and how it is of a very similar height. So hard to judge if it's if it's the same height or maybe slightly shorter. Next slide. So still from Luxton, still in front of the house, but looking at it from an angle. Gentlemen, would you mind taking the conversation out of the chamber? Just a little distracting up here. Thank you to provide some perspective about what it looks like from a distance. Next slide. And here is more from LaSalle and Luxton. This is almost the only area it is visible from because of the very large properties in the rear. There's one more photograph, which is the next slide. Uh, and this is uh, in front of the school, looking through their open gate. We can just barely make it out right there. But overall, it's it doesn't provide a very large uh, silhouette on the skyline. Next. And uh, that's actually the end of the photographs, because if you go one street over, you can't see it at all. Uh, next slide. Staff does recommend that the Commission approve Architectural Review AR 23-13, subject to the attachment. And we also have the recommendation uh, to allow the Zoning Administrator to make uh, the correction to the parking, or to allow the correction to the parking area. And that is copied on the next slide, should you wish to see it again. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Commissioners, any questions of staff? Um, yeah, I remember um, a couple of years ago, there was a situation where it was basically a new house was going to come into a relatively small lot in downtown. And one of the uh, conditions that was added was it was a dirt dirt surrounding the, the building that was going to go in and, and to, requiring that some sidewalk be added. And so that's sort of an aesthetic issue. And I'm, I was looking at the picture of this, and right next door there is a house with with sidewalk, uh, and then and then this one it's all it seems to be just dirt. Um, and I'm wondering, is it within our bailiwick to ask for something like that if we consider it an aesthetic issue? Um, I, I think staff will need to uh, get back to you on that. I just think it would make it, it's going to be a, looks like it's going to be a beautiful house and it might be nice to have like a good front part of it too, especially since other houses do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Evans? Um, yeah, I just want to uh, suggest that in future when they do the, the, the picture on their little computer thing that they try to match the color scheme that you're presenting because what was in the packet was just a big mass of white <laughs> versus your your it did say in the text but especially on your slide it did show that they're going to match that front which i think is very attractive and will i think work through the whole thing so i just wanted to bring that up also again just for my own education and benefit 
you've got a an item in the uh, page 32 of the packet. I don't know if you've got that, Eric. But the following paragraphs must be printed in the project plan submitted for a building permit under fire department notes. And I've never seen these kinds of notes before. So I was just curious, is this something unique to this particular project? Is this, because I thought any project that was over a thousand square feet or whatever it is, that was a remodel or something was happening had to be sprinklered. So that's what all this is dealing with. So I was just curious. I've never seen it before. And I thought, well, maybe it's just something I haven't seen. These are not unique. They're, they're not new either. Uh, you may be seeing them included in the resolution mm -hmm. uh, where they hadn't been included previously. Okay, that's uh, what I'm seeing there. All right. Um, and then I think I think the same question on page 33, there's items, the engineering and public works, stormwater management. All, all these are great, but I just don't remember mm -hmm. seeing them in a lot of these things. Um, are these going to be kind of standard now in a lot of these? Because it'll take some of our stormwater and our rain issues off of us having to ask mm -hmm. you guys each time. And they have been standard. Uh, the uh, particularly if you look at engineering, those three, seven, eight, and nine are a very common conditions that they place on it. Uh, they're being included in the resolution, uh, so that at this point Perfect. they are mounted. Like that. Thank you, Commissioner Lamanca. No. All right, we conclude our questions of staff. We'll give um, the applicant, applicant's architect, uh, up to five minutes if you wish to come forward and address. The um, uh, the uh, the commission. If you don't, that's okay too. Um, but you're welcome to come up and state your name and do that. All right. Then we're going to move to public comment. If there's anybody in the public wishing to address this issue, we'll give you up to three minutes to come to the podium, state your name, and um, speak on the item. Seeing no movement in the uh, audience, we will uh, close the public comment period and bring it back to the panel. Do we have any further discussion or do we want to entertain a motion? I move that we approve uh, architecture review application AR2316 for the project located at, oh, excuse me, uh, AR2313 for the project located at 1930 Luxon Street. Eric, do you have something to add? The condition of, of approval allowing the zoning administrator to approve changes is not written in the resolution. That is a new condition of approval. So if you would uh, like to add that, yes. that needs to be read aloud. With the addition of the uh, um, condition no. of approval that has been yes. recommended by staff. And that is the last slide in the presentation, if you need it. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Any further discussion? No? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, seeing none opposed, we have unanimous approval. Congratulations on that. An appeal may be submitted in writing within seven calendar days from the date of the meeting. The appeal shall state the pertinent facts and the basis for the appeal shall be accompanied by the required filing fee. Appeals to the city council shall be submitted to the city clerk. Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to um, our last item of business, which is the architectural review application AR 23-16. Charlie Hazelbaker of KB Bakewell, applicant and the Greater Victory Temple Church owner requesting architectural review approval of a new two-story 21 unit multifamily affordable housing project located at 1620 Broadway Avenue. Beth, the floor is yours. Thanks, good evening, commissioners and community who showed up tonight. Yes, 1620 Broadway. Um, as you know, a lot of things that come before you for architectural review um, are single family. This is a multifamily project. Last one that we saw was very likely Seaside Market. Um, this property is zoned RH, residential high density. That was a amendment done to the general plan more recently, approved by the city council on June 1st, 2023. And the site is currently developed with Greater Victory Temple Church, which is approximately 25,000 square feet. It's on a site that's approximately 1.99 acres, and it's currently served by 109 parking spaces. Next slide. 
So a little bit of a background in addition to those zone changes that uh, the city pursued and approved. It was on December 13th that we came forward with this project. Uh, commissioners heard the project and communicated some concerns. Some of those had to do with the staking and flagging that was not done uh, due to a concession due to the or from the affordable housing concessions because this is a hundred percent completely affordable project. And also with the mailing notices that are sent out, typically a 300 foot mailing notice is sent out to all properties um, within the vicinity, but to the property owners. Uh, in this case, what we redid based on your recommendations was mail out to every single address within the 300 feet. So hopefully the people actually residing in those units or addresses or properties uh, were in receipt of the notice. We also set up a uh, website that had the project plans on them. And the notice did include a couple images that you'll see tonight in terms of the 3D renderings that was done by the architectural team, as well as uh, a link to the website in those notices that went out. Next slide. California Environmental Quality Act uh, allows for exemptions for certain types of projects and an infill exemption, which is very likely there to encourage multifamily development without too many hurdles when it meets a couple criteria. One, that it's on a site that is less than five acres in size, which this is again at 1.99. And also that the site is within a uh, one half mile of a major transit stop or stop along a high quality transit corridor. The threshold for that is met by the stop at Broadway and Noche Buena. Next slide. Just context uh, map on the left is an aerial image of the site. You see Greater Victory Temple pushed towards the corner of Broadway and Yosemite with solar panels on top, the parking lot towards the south of the site. The image on the right is the map that was used for the rezoning. So as you can see, Hem Plaza, which is to the south of the site, which is outlined in red, um, and Via Del Monte to the right were both already zoned RH. So that entire block, with the exception of the corner in which the church was located, is zoned RH, and that corner church property was zoned RS12 or single-family residential. It's common in Seaside to see a lot of churches in the single-family zones, just with use permits to be able to do that use there. Uh, next slide. So the proposed project, it's a 21 unit multifamily three-story uh, building, affordable housing building. Um, maximum height is 42 feet, seven inches. And the numbers that are labeled around the site are the approximate distances from the property lines. Um, so if Broadway is our front, Opposite that is our rear. We're not having any issues with meeting the code minimums for our front side setbacks. And the rear is a development concession that they're requesting. In this zone, when you go above a certain height, it requires a greater rear setback. So for the lower heights, it could have been 15. If you went above 24 feet, it goes up to requiring a 20 foot setback. So in their concession, they're requesting a three, three feet reduction to that required rear setback. Um, you can also see on this where there's going to be a pathway going towards the church and the pathways around the site. We'll get to another slide that better shows the landscaping. You can see some of the parking being maintained on the site for both the church and the housing. Next slide. Uh, this is just a little bit more of an in-depth summary of what you can expect to of each unit type. There's three unit types going from the smallest at a studio of 428 square feet to a one bedroom at 637 square feet and a two bedroom at 893 square feet. Also listed there are the deck or balcony sizes in terms of the square footage for each of those and a breakdown of the first, second and third floors and the total square footage of the building at 15,433 square feet. Next slide. Uh, so a bit of the code analysis we do, even though it's architectural review, we are at this point making sure that 
all of the zoning code requirements are met. So the maximum height that would be allowed for any of those properties in the RH zone throughout the city is 48 feet. They're proposing 42 feet, seven inches. So they're compliant with that. Um, the parking gets a little bit into government code, which is outside of our zoning code, but it does allow specifically for affordable housing developments on church properties to be able to reduce the parking uh, to a certain extent. And with this having 109 existing spaces, they're proposing 41 of those spaces for removal are 38% with 68 spaces to remain. And the removal at 38% complies with the state law that says you could remove up to 50. So they're not going up to the max that they could have re uh, removed. They're keeping more that they can on site. Uh, moving on to number three, the setbacks, again, compliant, as I showed with those numbers that were um, highlighted on the last slide of the site plan with the exception of the rear setback for which they're requesting one of their four development concessions. And in the staff report resolution, there also are conditions of approval for this project, specifically numbers 17 through 20 kind of cover some of the things that will be seen when they submit their building permit plan set, which is where you typically get down to the minutia and details that you need to see for that to get approved and actually built. Next slide. Uh, reviewing the development concessions. So again, if you're doing an affordable housing project, dependent on the number of affordable units that you're including in that project, you're allowed anywhere from one to four concessions. With this being a 100% affordable housing project, we're looking at four concessions. One that they chose to waive was the staking and flagging requirement, which typically before we go um, for a Board of Architectural Review, 14 days in advance of the hearing, the applicants typically required to erect staking and flagging, which they show the ridge height and essentially the boundaries or exterior kind of corners of the walls uh, on the actual physical site. That way the neighbors can see how it's going to affect their neighborhood. Um, the second concession is a waiver to both the common and private open space requirements. On the previous slide, we looked at a slide that comes, kind of summarized the um, balconies and decks that were provided to each residential unit. Some of those are above what's required. Some of those are below. Overall, as a cumulative number, it falls below, as does it for the common space required for a multifamily residential development. The third waiver covered for the third time is a reduction to the required 20 foot rear yard setback. And lastly, uh, a waiver to the maximum floor area ratio. Floor area ratio is a percentage of the overall lot size, which you're allowed to have in terms of square footage with the existing church having 25,000 square feet and the proposed building at 15,433. Um, we come up with a square footage of 40,433 and an FAR of 0 0.47. So essentially 1,426 square feet over what would typically be allowed. So they're not asking for a huge allowance to that. It's a small increase um, to accommodate the project. Next slide. Uh, looking into colors and materials and architectural design, we reviewed this last time, kind of a mission style influenced uh, apartment building or multifamily structure. The roofing will be clay tiles and the various finishes in terms of the overall body of the building, finishing the antique white, um, a couple of other colors, foothills on the trim and the entry doors to be very similar in the same family of colors um, and marching up towards the darkest color that we have, which is black fox for the metal railings on the balconies and the stairways that you can see on the left and right sides, which will access the corridors that lead to the units. Next slide. Uh, north elevation. So this is what you will see as you're leaving the church. Um, same, the materials and colors around the complete building. There's not much change on the elevations for any of that at all. Uh, moving on to the next slide. The east elevation. This will be facing Via Del Monte. Um, and yeah, just showing 
in the middle part, that's the access stair that I referenced before that you will take up if you live on the second or third floor to get to the unit uh, corridors. And the last slide, Slide. <laughs> this was slightly modified as the lower walls of uh, that stairway were removed, uh, exposing it a bit more, and also uh, windows were added kind of above those exterior storage areas that you see on the left, so affording more views towards the west, um, towards the Monterey Bay. Next slide. The roof plan, again, mentioned the proposed height, uh, which is a handful of feet under the maximum allowed of 48 feet at 42.7. And you can see all the changes that happen here. So that is at the peak, everything else with the different ridge lines and the valleys and a slope of four to 12. Um, there's a range in terms of the roof heights that you have on this project, and you'll see those in the upcoming renderings that the architectural team did. Next slide. So this topographic map, um, the lines represent just changes in elevation where you see the project site approximately outlined in red. It's an elevation of around 200 feet. And then if you look at the bottom right um, corner, it's around 252. So within that block, half block distance uh, of the project site, as you're going towards Ancon Street, Costa and Athens, which lead up to the park, um, you're looking at a 50 foot change in grade. So the project at 42 feet in height, if you're standing down in that bottom corner on Ancon in Athens, you're barely going to see this three-story structure projecting from there um, due to making up that difference. So really, if we were to measure the top elevation of that church um, building, the proposed building at the church site, it would be at around 244. So anything else on that map that's a less than 244, it's going to be essentially level with the top of that roof line. Next slide. So these are the renderings provided by the architectural team. The left image will be as it exists, and the right image, you'll see the structure there. Um, this is kind of it in place of the staking and flagging, which will give everybody an idea of the massing of the structure, the location of it, the height of it in context to the surrounding buildings. So this is from Yosemite. Oh, this one is also from Yosemite, but that's all, we can go back, we can go forward. Yeah, from Yosemite, um, looking kind of east past you know, Via Del Monte is then behind that. This is the main portion of the parking lot that they're occupying. You see those now open stairway corridors, the additional windows added to afford more views of the bay. Next slide. This is from uh, a viewpoint in Via Del Monte looking west. So the image on the left, you'll notice the uh, cypress trees that are blocking a portion of that view. And then where the building then is located, you can also kind of use the lowest branch of that tree as a point of reference um, if you're looking left to right in terms of trying to compare how much it's gonna occupy of that space. Next slide. This is looking west, kind of from where the cars are parked in that kind of shared alleyway um, in between Via Del Monte and the uh, church site. So more to the left, but you also see how it's not impacting the view, even if those trees were or weren't there. Um, you're looking more at the residential portion of Seaside at that point and less of the water. Next slide. 
this is from that like higher grade portion that I was mentioning off of Ancon Street. And the image on both the left and the right have the dashed red line, which shows the roof line of the church. And then I circled um, the roof peak of the proposed project, which you can barely make out. I had to focus a bit more to figure out where it was, but it's circled for you to see on the right-hand side. So even from that point on Ancon Street, it's it's less obtrusive than the views that we saw from Yosemite, for example. Next slide. This is from Broadway, uh, looking south. I believe I brought this image up last time saying how essentially the image on the right, which shows the structure, would pretty much just be obscuring what's behind it in Hem Plaza. And you can see that from these images. Next slide. Uh, shifting away from the elevations and the massing of that building and going into a small detail, um, important in a lot of projects, and in this one, not really an architectural design element used to kind of enhance the exterior um, of the building, but more so the lighting that will be used. And they're all exterior downlit, kind of recessed, so not much of an impact or a contribution to the architectural design, but still an important element to have those in the common spaces like the hallways, in the stairways for safety purposes, and then on the balconies to kind of create a warm effect at night. Next slide. Landscaping on this site, uh, there's a lot of existing landscaping or lawn that you see around the church property that's not part of the um, but just south of that, which you see in that bright green highlighted section kind of on the left middle, is the required stormwater runoff sections. That will be a new landscaped area, as will all of the blue and kind of hot pink areas uh, around the building itself. The hot pink areas are listed as ornamental plantings, whereas the blue is listed as hydro seed. And if we move on to the next slide, I think we have a species list. Um, so we can see some of that variety in terms of the ornamental plantings, a lot of small uh, one gallon plantings, but spaced out along all those hot pink areas that you saw of, I believe, mostly California natives. And we do have conditions of approval regarding the hydro seed, the establishment of it, and that it be also 100% native and a good mix of both annuals and perennials. Next slide. Ah. Recommendation. We recommend as staff that you approve this project subject to the conditions of approval and the plans and all the attached exhibits. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Um, we'll start with any commissioner questions of staff before we. Commissioner Lamaika? Commissioner Dodson? No questions. Yeah, I got a few. Sorry. <clears throat> Can we go back to slide four? While they're getting there, I'll just ask a question. Yeah. Um, is there a reason why Broadway was considered the front of the property and not Yosemite, considering at least this part of, of the the structure, you know, it, it kind of excesses yeah. off Yosemite? I'm just wondering if the side yard setback smaller than the rear setback, why did we have to get a, a you know, a, a concession on 17 feet? Yeah, it more has to do with the church being there and that established a front okay. years ago. So anything that follows, follows that same pattern. Otherwise, we could be messing something yeah, up that we don't want to touch. Correct. Perfect. Yeah. Beth, I got a question on the, I'm trying to find where it is. There was a line that caused me to hiccup a second. It's It's at the bottom. The proposed project is located along the high quality transit corridor of which there's a pretty clear definition in all the different codes that are referenced throughout the packet. But it says, as there are three transit stops with service intervals no longer than 15 minutes within one half mile of the project. So are you talking about the distance, the, the time interval between those three transit stops is less than 15 minutes? 
the buses arrival times at the stops. So the frequency, I think there's three lines that stop at the Noche Buena and Broadway stops. Yeah, there's there's Jazz A, there's Jazz B, and then there's 94 or something weird right. like that. 94. So if you were to look at their timetable and kind uh -huh. of look at all three of those schedules, you would see that the service interval meets that 15 minute. Well, it's 30 minutes. What's 30 minutes? The inter the interval, well, for instance, it says that projects was one, one half mile of either an existing major transit stop, which this is not, or a stop along an existing high quality transit corridor should be presumed to cause a less than significant transportation impact. And it's a stop. In other words, the definition that the, the CEQA guidelines are using that the uh, the, the church, the, the ones that are in here in the packet that um, talk about religious institutions and what can be done within a high quality transit corridor, all rely on 30 min uh, 15 minutes. But every single bus that goes by Broadway or that goes by Noche Buena, if you look at the MST thing, is 30 minutes. It's not... But they're not all arriving, for example, like at noon. So you might have one that arrives at noon and then it comes again at 1230. You might have one that gets there at 1215 and then 1245. So within that one stop, you have those three lines arriving with the 15 minutes. Oh, Dominique, are you back? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. So, pick so up yeah, where my, you left so off. my question is just you know, if I look at an MST map and I look at what's going up Broadway, sure, it's thirty minutes. That's the time interval, other than whatever that odd one is that comes every hour or hour and a half. Sure. And then if I look at Noche Buena, because coming up to that point, it's a fifteen-minute interval, and then they split. I don't know why MST did that. So I'm just concerned that a lot of what we're basing our assumptions on is on something that I, you know, apparently there is some study that's done that says, oh yeah, if somebody needs to get a bus, they can go to either the, there's three or four on Broadway, or they can go to the two on Noche Buena. And somehow that's coming in at less than 15 minutes. You can you can uh, right. explain if you want, but I can't understand. Um, Commissioner, if you like, um, I, I can show you the math where we took the various stops and um, calculated. It comes out to about 9.68 minutes for each bus on average during the uh, morning time period. Um, and it's 9.64 minutes between buses on average for the evening period. But where where's that happening? That's exactly. at the corner of Noche Buena and Broadway, which is located just under a half mile from the site. But what I'm questioning is if if a bus A is going, well, I think it's bus B that goes up Broadway. And that's 30 minute intervals. Right. But and they intersect at that point. So it, 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 it's that. between it's at a stop. So it's not the lines. There is a stop and it's that intersection where you've got multiple bus lines coming together. And that is located less than a half mile from the site. Right. That's, right. that's the one I know. So mean. it's that major transit stop Cross that's located. Me, Casa. Casa House. Well, it's the intersection. Okay. Right. Well, yeah. bus stops down the Right. Um, yeah. So that is that is the location. And that is what causes it to meet that definition as a major transit stop is you've got the, those two bus lines intersect. Actually, there's the three. There's But the 90 is just occasional but the just the, the math alone is like half an hour and a half an hour how can it be nine minutes <laughs> um weird. well i mean jazz a there's 628 706 743 823 902 944 a.m and then for jazz say, b say those again because they, they can't be less than half an hour well that's southbound and then you've got northbound going the other way 
655, 735. So you've got both directions. And then Jazz B is it? So that's I mean, how they're doing it. They're getting both directions. So they're getting four four lines. Basically, got yeah. It. Yeah. That's what was so confusing to me is when I looked at the map, it was a half an hour. So, yeah. I mean, it it took a while. Yeah. Well, I can see <laughs> whole spreadsheet. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was my first question. Um, Kind of going back to the question that I had for Eric earlier on the, the fire um, stuff. I didn't see anything in this. Uh, is that because technically that's kind of more of a planning commission issue? Or is that a BAR issue? I am not sure what your question oh, was he, there. There were a lot of, of uh, um, requirements in the conditions that were sprinkler related. Uh, that varies based on the review type. I think they consider it more of a courtesy to let single family projects know that because it can add a substantial cost versus a project that's going to cost a lot and is kind of assumed with the designers on board that it won't. So the boilerplate that we have where it's going to meet all fire requirements or all police requirements, that's that's adequate for this? That will definitely happen. Okay. Yes. When I saw it in the other one and when I wasn't used to it, it was like, oh, maybe I should be more tuned into that. Um Kind of a silly question because I don't know the answer to this, but I thought we had a moratorium on meters, so water meters. So what's the what's the story on that? Uh, our city attorney's here. The microphone's waiting. Just got, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening in or in the community that want to know about water. So if I figured I'd ask the question. Yeah, thank you for that question. Really great question. Um, the good news is that our water meter moratorium for Seaside Muni is getting ready to um, sunset. And so this, aside from that, though, this project, the church has so much historic water use and has been retrofitted since the pre-80s that there's plenty of water credit on site as well to serve this part of the project. So you got both. You, you both have the historic water use, the water savings that is on that site already associated with that site. Plus our water meter technical moratorium is getting ready to expire. Let's say the water meter wasn't going to be sunsetted. Would that be a problem? Because I would have thought that you're still going to put meters there, correct? You just have one meter there. Oh, so there'll be one meter. You could have what you could have one meter there. This it is planned though to have a separate meter, okay. I think. But um in theory in theory, meter? in theory, you could do that if you wanted to do that. Hair splitting, but I figured I'd better right. ask. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I mentioned last time, and it still concerns me, is that when I look at you know our charge to as now putting on our board of architectural hat is whether the character quality and design approach of the project is going to fit that, that spot. And I'm still uncomfortable. I, I personally, I like the building as far as the way it looks, but I'm not sure it's a fit for that location. The church has got so much brick with stucco and then him has got, you know, that a whole new, beautiful kind of modern uh, gray off gray, maroon doors so i just wish we could do something let, let me ask you something real quick right now our our questions are of staff because staff's presentation has been concluded so Perfect. we're going to get into our comments and stuff after public comment period do you have any other questions of staff at the conclusion of okay no other questions of staff okay thank you for the presentation what we're going to do at this point is we'll give the applicant applicant representatives um I don't think you need 10 minutes. I'll give you up to 10 minutes, but I think if you want, you have some time to come up and, and add something if if you would like to. I know we've heard from you before, um, but we'll give you that and then we'll open to public comment to the general public. Um, but while you're up there also, if we have any specific questions of the applicant, I'd like to use this time to do it. And I don't know that we do. Thanks. My name is Charlie Hazelbaker. I work for KB Home. So I truly have nothing more to add than we did last time and this time. Our architect is here. If you have any questions of us or the Bakewells or we're here to answer questions, if we need to save time to defer to after you guys debate and you have more questions, that's fine. However you guys want to handle it. 
Fair enough. This is Ralph Strauss, our architect. Commissioner, do we have any questions specifically of the applicant or the applicant's architect at this time? Okay. So, and, and I'd like to just add one. Yeah, please. One thing, ahead. if I may, Ralph Strauss, SDG Architects. Um, since our last discussion, I was, I, you know, we described the project at that time, so I won't repeat myself. However, you know, based on input that from the last meeting, uh, we did some pretty extensive three-dimensional modeling to answer the questions about the mass of the building and how it fits into the surrounding neighborhood. So we we have the uh, gentleman who did the 3D modeling. He's he's listening to the meeting through Zoom as well. And so if you have any specific questions about his procedures or how that work was done, he's available to answer those questions as well. Okay, appreciate yeah. that very much. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, and this time what we're gonna do is we're gonna open um, to, to general public comment. If anybody wish to address the commission, please come to the podium. We'll give you three minutes. Please state your name and, um, and, and share with us. Uh, good night, uh, everyone. Uh, gentlemen of the Planning Commission, my name is Dexter Kennedy. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address you uh, tonight. On behalf of Pastor Ronald Britt, who could not attend to tonight's meeting due to a family emergency out of town, he has asked me to speak on his behalf tonight. So I stand before you not just as a representative of our beloved Greater Victory Temple Church of God in Christ, but also as a concerned member of this vibrant community. Jesus very clearly tells us to keep our eyes open to those who are in need. James 2, 15 and 16 reads, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? Our faith teaches us the importance of compassion, generosity, love for our neighbors. Today, we have come to you with a proposal that aligns with these principles and seeks to address a critical need in our community, which is affordable housing. Our church, guided by the spirit of goodwill, wishes to contribute to the well-being of our fellow citizens by developing an affordable housing apartment complex on our land. Before delving into any spe specifics, I want to address this concept that often arises in discussions like these, which is NIMBYism, N-I-M-B-Y, or not in my backyard. It is understandable that people may have concerns about change and development in their immediate surroundings. However, I pray that you consider an alternative perspective, one that is rooted in a shared faith and community values. I propose that we embrace the concept of YIGBY, Y-I-G-B-Y, which stands for yes in God's backyard. Instead of focusing on exclusion, resistance, let us come together as a community that believes in the power of compassion, understanding, and collective responsibility. The teachers of our faith encourage us to open our hearts and extend a helping hand to those in need. The proposed affordable housing complex on our church land is not just a building project. It is an embodiment of our commitment to making a positive impact on the lives of our neighbors and in our seaside community. It is an expression of the belief that we are all children of the same God, deserving of dignity, security, and a place to call home. So tonight, as a church body, we're here representing, representing Greater Victory Temple, and we ask that you approve this architectural review so this project can move forward. Thank you. You did. Anybody else like to share? Okay. <laughs> I probably couldn't sleep tonight if I came in these chambers and just sat down. <laughs> so, uh, good Please, evening. Yeah, just state your name. And then we'll yes, the yes, yes. Thank you. Good evening. I am Annalisa Mitchell, resident of Seaside, California. Um, a member of Greater Victory Temple. I did know what Dexter has said, the gentleman before me. The project is very much needed. The, the young lady that was up here, she did a beautiful um, 
presentation, but I would like to put on the record, I was just sitting there when I was reading the agenda of Greater Victory Temple in an agreement with um, KB Bakewell. They have brought so much to this community and I started reflecting back on Seaside Highlands. I started reflecting back on the sidewalks over there. I started reflecting back on Soberfield. I started reflecting back on blues in the schools. I started reflecting back on all of the nonprofits. And I sat there and I said, dang, what's going to be the signature project? Is it Campus Town? Is it this project? And it came to me, no, it's the next one, because they keep coming up with innovative ways to pour back into Seaside. And so I encourage you to, to vote this project in, because if we leave and go to Walgreens right now and it's raining, I promise you there's at least five people sleeping up underneath that tarmac. And Seaside is better than that. We need to find a place where we can house the unhoused people and that there are students that are getting degrees and having to live. I have two college students, one on her way from Howard. She can't afford to come back home. One on his way from TSU. He can't afford to come back home unless he came back home to live with his parents, with his parents. So anybody that is bringing affordable housing to the community. We have a responsibility. We really have a moral responsibility to see what we can do to make it work. So I thank the Bakewells publicly. Um, congratulations to this dais as you consider this request and to the citizens of Seaside. We're better together. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else? I don't want to close it prematurely. All right. Speak now or forever hold your peace, right? Okay. Um, we're going to uh, close the public comment period and bring the discussion back up here to the commissioners. And um, and then if, if a question does arise, we'll invite you up to respond to that. Um, I'm going to start at this end just in case you have one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the only question I have is that um, the church is losing 41 parking spaces. Is that correct? Yeah. And so the apartment complex is 21 units. So would that still give the church enough parking if everybody had one car in 21 units? That's maybe something for the church to answer. Is that is that a staff question or an applicant question? Well, and but I I think and and maybe I'm picking on a turn. I think the argument that's been made is that under the the different government codes right. now yeah. and the concessions for development of affordable housing, they don't have to even account for those twenty one parking yeah. spaces because of the exemption. So, I mean, you guys, if, if I spoke incorrectly, feel free to... We discussed it at the last meeting. Yeah. It, was that it should be in your minutes. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, yeah, except well, you said Andrew's the one that nailed it down right. and said, look, we've got a study that says that they're coming, and it does meet the, the different codes. That was the key. It yeah. didn't look like it met the codes, but now it could be magic math. I don't know. But. <laughs> Hi, my name is Danny Bakewell. I'm part of the KB Bakewell team. Um, just to answer your question... Um, you're correct. We we are under the presumption that we meet the requirement for the parking for the mass transit exemption, which we're using uh, towards this project. Uh, in addition to that, you're correct that the every resident doesn't have to have a parking space. But we also took into consideration. We talked extensively with the church about how are they going to be able to provide parking for their constituents on Sundays and anytime the church is doing other events. Um, they didn't seem to have a problem with it. Obviously their membership is, some of their members are here, but they also have an agreement across the street with the Seventh-day Adventist church across the street, which, church, which goes to church on Saturdays, which allows them to have additional parking on Sundays that they can do. And they also have some parking 
they actually own a portion of the lot that's up above uh, that faces Villa Del Monte. So they include those in their parking and all of those things. So we've taken that into consideration as we addressed and designed this facility. So, Well, and it strikes me as though that the only issues really are Sunday morning or if you have a midweek service, that there'll be the concentrated use during those times. Right. And if the church is mindful of that and is willing to work around it, I think the benefits obviously outweigh the, you know, in, in your guys' uh, calculus. Um, any other questions, Commissioner Dotson? Well, I sort of feel the same way now that I felt last time we were here. I, I actually like the look of this building. I think it will fit in that area. We already have a lot of apartments in that area and they've recently been upgraded. They look very nice now, and I think that this will fit in with it. Yes, it's a little more denser. There's a space between the apartments, but I think it's it's going to be an attractive building. And I I applaud bringing in some low low uh, cost housing for people that need it to live somewhere here on the peninsula. So I'm I'm following your approval of this. Yeah, I take a different tact in that. What I'm concerned about is that we're shoehorning in another 21 low income units in a space that already has approximately 300 between Ham Plaza and the villas. So we got what, what 92 in Ham, and we got 82 in, in, um, and where we're going to need affordable housing is in the north of the city and in the east of the city, not putting it where we've already got it concentrated. So that's my problem with it. Um, I also don't, uh, sorry, Keith, I, I think it would be a perfect building in a different spot of town. I think it'd be great. But, and by the way, uh, um, Beth, there was in in the um, in the packet that we got, or in the, in the, the link, there was some views from him, or at least one, but I don't think they were in your presentation. And, and, I would have liked to have seen more of that. And, and so my question for the, for the commission is when, um, when John in particular asked for a 3D model, are we comfortable that we got what our motion was? We got a lot of great pictures with, you know, again, a two-dimensional look, but it, I was expecting something more three-dimensional on a computer that I could then play with and see what it looked like from him, what it looked like from the villas, what it looked like from, uh, Yosemite, and we didn't get that. So if if everybody's okay with what we got, then I don't think there's any problem at this point. But I just want to make sure that we were all. It wasn't a three D model. It was pictures of a two dimensional building there. Um, and we don't need to take a vote on that. I just wanted to throw that out there in case anybody else was concerned about that. I know if John were here, I think he'd be saying, "Wait a minute, <laughs> where's where's my model? I want to see what it looks like." Um, so I, I wish, and, and, you know, I'm not going to make it a conditional approval unless everybody else feels this way, but I wish that if, if this project's going to get approved, that it, there was at least some homage to the church building the way that, I mean, that's a beautiful building and it's got nice brickwork. It's got nice stucco contrast. And I just feel like this building, and it certainly doesn't match him at all. And Plaza just looks beautiful now. And I don't think that this is upgrading the neighborhood, upgrading the, the fit in that, that spot. So that those are my problems with it. Thank you, Commissioner Evans. Um, so I just want to reiterate that the last week or last meeting, um, I, I know that my objections, the objections that I heard from this commission weren't about the project, it was about the process. Um, I mean, there, there's some fine tuning of the project, but it was the process where we didn't feel as though we had we had been given the information we needed to consider this properly and that and that that transparency issue was where I think we got the sort of the the emotional reaction that you got from the commission. Um, I, I've been a home builder in Monterey County for 35 years. I've built, over 700 homes and developed almost 3,000. Um, and I've built a lot of affordable housing in this community. Uh, I am almost never opposed to any new housing because we need housing in Monterey County, period. 
we don't just need affordable housing. We just need housing. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that right now that the only way we can get housing approved is when it's affordable and we're relying upon some sort of a subsidized program because I think we need all of the housing. And and I've, I've watched it because when I moved here to live here permanently in the late, well, the early 90s, uh, you could still buy a house in Seaside for $150,000. And it's really been the lack of housing supply uh, over the, the ensuing decades that has left us in the position that we are now where it goes to the people who have the highest amount of money and not for the regular working folks that live in our community. That said, you'll, you'll never find me opposed to a housing project unless there's some really inherent flaw in the project. Um, I agree that I think that there was a miss. There was a swing and a strike on the architectural design. It looks like this was taken out of a file cabinet of, of a project that was done somewhere else and it fit the site and that the architecture looks like it would fit in Seaside Highlands or fit in Las Palms Ranch too, but it doesn't have the architectural care that, that you guys have done when you created the theme of Seaside Highlands or when the specific plan for um, university uh, or uh, campus town was done. Um, so I, I think that was a miss. But at the same time, I am a strong advocate of property rights. And if a homeowner wants to design something that is ugly, to some degree, they have the right to design something that's ugly. And so I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to oppose this project because I think the architecture could have been more fitting with the neighborhood. That's a small thing because I think that the benefit of this is far greater. And I also hope, I hope that this project creates an incredible passive income cash flow for the church for generations to come, that it's going to fund uh, ministry and church services and community outreach that the church does and will be able to do better. So, I mean, I think that the the concept of the partnership between A.B. Bakewell and uh, and the church is marvelous. And the way that the, uh, the state is creating incentives for different types of development, including development on excess land on, on church properties, I think all of that is, is very beneficial. So um, I appreciate that you guys have made the effort. I'll comment on a 3D model coming from where I'm at is not necessarily a virtual model. It's a 3D image kind of fit into a picture. I, I mean, I think some of the pictures were selectively picked so that they, you know, maybe enhanced the argument. Maybe you're not going to pick the worst ones, right? And I think that's okay too, but I think it, it does represent what it's going to look like. And there were many perspectives that showed that the impact was not as daunting as we perhaps feared not having seen flagging. So from my perspective, um, uh, you know, you have my support with a couple words on it, but they're, 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 they're small issues and they're not going to derail it. Um, I, I appreciate that the church sees the ministry opportunity of this um, as well. And I think that's an entirely appropriate and fitting kind of partnership because of the reasons that Dexter uh, pointed out. So, um, you know, all of that said, and I do appreciate the staff addressed the concerns where, we do need to comply with the statutes. And if there was a concern that we weren't, you know, we need to, we need to know that we've covered our back. So I, I'm, I'm satisfied with the things that were answered. So that's kind of where I stand. Um, and I mean, at this point, unless there's further discussion, are we at a place where we want to entertain a motion? Okay. Do you want to make it? Somebody else. You, okay. Does somebody else want to? All right. Well, I'll, I'll make the motion tonight. Uh, I'll make the motion that we approve uh, architectural review application AR 23-16 um, uh, for the new three-story 21 unit multifamily affordable housing project located at 1620 Broadway Avenue on the Greater Victory Temple Church site in the high density residential zoning district. Are there any um, staff, is there any specific conditions that we need to make reference to apart from the resolution? Okay, then I make that motion. Second. 
Okay, do we have a vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. So we have a majority approval, three to one. Um, and uh, an appeal may be submitted in writing within seven calendar days from the date of this meeting. The appeal shall state the pertinent facts and the basis for the appeal and shall be accompanied by the required filing fee. Appeals to the city council shall be submitted to the city clerk. Um, with that said, congratulations on the approval. I hope this moves forward pretty well. I, I do wanna say that that I appreciate the, the deliberation that we have here. And I also appreciate that even when we, we we often reach consensus and even when we don't reach consensus, there's a lot of respect on this panel for the way we go about the process. And I think that's the most important thing. I think some of the fierceness that you may have heard of us from us last week was all of us in defense of one another and, and respecting, especially when, when one party or another, uh, you know, felt charged about the issue. So um, thank you. So with that, we're going to move on to um, item number seven, reports from commissioners. Commissioners, do we have any reports? No? All right, item number eight, reports from staff. So just uh, letting the commission know, we do have two items scheduled for the 24th. Okay. Um, I don't expect they're going to be large items. There's a parking reduction and a master sign program. Um, so hopefully it'll be a much shorter night. I did want to ask um, whether we should plan on having the next meeting after that one would normally fall on February 14th. Um, I just wanted to know if we should plan on having a meeting on that night, or if you think that it's Valentine's. People, it is Valentine's day. Well, um, I have no problem with the 14th. I, I mean, no I'm okay with either. it because it's midweek, but will, will our wives have a problem with it for those no. of us who are married? No. I think okay. we can schedule it for now. Okay, great. Thank um, you. Just for calendaring purposes. Andrew, I will probably not be here on the 24th so if you're going to have a quorum issue let me know okay okay I all right change things but i'd rather not understood okay we'll we'll run a quorum check early you know what i we, i really appreciate it for what it's worth um when dominique does send out um, an email in advance which, which doubles as both a quorum check and kind of a reminder plus the link to the agenda that's that's always very helpful okay with that, I'd like to make a motion. We adjourn. Can I have a second? Love to... Wait, okay, ahead, not yet. Oh, no, no, no. I was going to make a motion to adjourn. Can I have a second? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, we're adjourned. Love to...